Semi-retirement. I'm just not interested in touring anymore. And it really is about April and, and the music. And people like our songs, and they want to hear those songs. And the fans too. They want to hear more music. It really is about April and, and the music. So find somebody else that would do that instead of me. I've been on the road for 50 years. I was on the road before April Wine got together. I'm going to still be involved in other aspects, but no more touring. <laughs> I grew up listening to the music of April Wine as a young adult, and I had the privilege of working for them. And now tonight, I am honored to be a part of inducting them into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame. Over the last 40 years, they've recorded 16 studio albums and given us some of the most memorable guitar riffs this country has ever heard. Please welcome Miles Goodwin and Brian Greenway, April Wine. I'd like to thank Karis for this fantastic honor on behalf of April Wine members past and present. And they are... Basically, I just let the band know that I'm not interested in touring anymore, so we're looking for someone to replace me. April Wine Audition 2, Roller, take 75. <laughs> It won't be easy, but, you know, it will happen. You know, there's so many classic rock bands that have had to replace singers, drummers, guitar players, for all the obvious reasons, you know. Uh, some don't want to tour anymore, some can't. We'll find somebody. Nobody really wanted the band to end because I didn't want to tour, including me. I didn't want to stop what I love to do, and that's write, record, and to sing, and to play guitar. I, I like all those things. I'm just tired of traveling, worn out. If that means uh, then if I don't tour, I don't do anything, I think that's a bit drastic. I know that's not what the other guys in the band want or the other people that work at this thing called April Wine full-time. It's a job. It's a full-time job for not only band members, but crew members and other people that are associated through agencies. There's a lot going on, and I want to continue doing everything but touring. So it really is about April Wine and the music. Miles and his friend Jim Henman started it all in a basement in the Halifax suburb of Waverly. Miles and I had played in a band during high school called Woody's Termites. When I tried phone in 1966, I was a young teenager with Jim and Woody's Termites. We were a cover band, that's what we did. We did cover songs. So we were playing the best songs out there for about three years. Playing Sam and Dave, you know, some pick, uh, James Brown, the American rock and roll. I suspect that really influenced the craft of writing tunes. And I had the opportunity to write songs. Here's a song that I wrote in about 1966 or 7. It's very juvenile, but I was a young teenager. It was like this. In 
1956 when I was very young. I was there in front of a black and white TV. I watched Elvis on Ed Sullivan. I was mesmerized. You know, country music influenced me at first. And then when my mother died in 1959, when I was 11, and I had already been very attracted to music as a very young fellow. I turned to music big time. That was my place. That's where I went. And then the British invasion. And I loved everything British, everything from Dave Clark Five, the Rolling Stones to the Beatles to everybody else. I was subjected to everybody. It was like a sponge. And then, of course, things started getting heavy, getting into Zeppelins. And then in high school, in a school band, cover band called Woody's Termites. With Doug Grace. Jim, of course, on bass guitar. Dave Dodgeworth on drums. Greg Steven on keyboard. And you hold hands with me. And that's not the way to be. Girl, you're treating me And in the late 60s, the group I'd been with went through a transformation into rock and roll, and we formed Mash McCann. I left home to be a professional musician in 67 and 68. I was with a band called Eastgate Sanctuary down in Cape Breton. Miles Goodwin and I were in a band together. We were called the Eastgate Sanctuary. We played for a year or so, and then in 1969, he quit the band. Now, how long has the band been together? Uh, 1969. Holy Started that smoke. band in 1969 <laughs> in Nova Scotia. I talked my cousins into starting this band, and they said, well, we'll do it if you go get Miles, and I said, okay, so... I went down and spent some time with Miles, told him what we wanted to do. We wanted to write all original songs and get out of Nova Scotia because there wasn't that much of a future here. About a man who left from nowhere to be someone And every day he has to pay in every way So my cousin David, he knew more than we did about the business side at that point. He kind of ran the show in the business sense and that. He did a lot of that work. The very early days, we spent the first four months of our existence were in Nova Scotia, and then we moved to Montreal. April Wine hit the road, and there was no looking back. We spent a lot of time with Mash McCann. We did a lot of shows with them, and we became friends with those guys. Now, Mash McCann was a very original and unique attraction. And then 1970, April Wine came up to Montreal, and Mash McCann took April Wine on the road, and that's where I met Miles and the boys. And I was in Mash McCann from 1972 until 1974, and Steve Lang was in that band in 1975. This started with a band called Cheek in 1968, and Steve Lang was the bass player in that band. I had gone to high school with him, and so they got me in the band. And then Cheek broke up, and Mash McCann had broken up too in 72. So Pierre Seneca grabbed me, Lord Nearing, and Steve Lang to join the second edition of Mash McCann. So this was the second band now that I was in with Steve Lang. And with Mash McCann, we had toured with April Wine. So I got to know them. And that lasted until 73. In 75, Steve joined April Wine, and I joined in 77. So Steve sort of preceded every band that I eventually joined from 68 until I joined in 77. So those were my lucky breaks, and he was my lucky star, I guess. Gig by gig, they built a huge loyal following. I saw the band, and loved them, just thought they were great. They were signed to Aquarius Records. April Wine, 71. Brothers David and Richie Henman, their cousin Jim Henman, and myself. The first album was called April Wine, came out in 71. So the only song that did anything on that album was called Fast Train.
Her first single was Fast Train in 1971, which did, was top 40 in Canada. Doing the first album, I see four separate guys just learning to write and play together. We were all working our own independent music and things. I don't see a unit on that album uh, because we weren't at that point. It only happened after Miles took control of the band that it started to become a unit. I was a victim of some negative aspects of it. So I left the band and I left the business and came back here to Nova Scotia and went to work in a medical laboratory. But on the side, I was always writing and recording and kind of had it in my back of my mind that when I left a nine to five job, that I would get back into music. So the bass player singer picked up and left on us and he was replaced by Jimmy Clinch. The second album produced Drop Your Guns. Yeah, David Henman wrote, Drop Your Guns. Your hand Drop Your Guns was the only song that I wrote that was a hit. I wrote other songs, three of them, I think, but they weren't as commercially viable as Drop Your Guns. So Drop Your Guns and the song called Teacher, the B-side of Could Have Been a Lady, were two songs that I wrote. I think it was on record about that time we started leaving Montreal area and going across the country. So Donald K. Donald, the promoter, who was uh, representing us and he was part of the management team at the same time, Terry Flood Management, he says, let's go across the country. Let's go to these small towns. Let's do this, this tour. It's never been done like this. Let's do it. And we're going, yeah, let's do this. We went right from high school to, to touring across Canada and doing that kind of thing. You could have been a lady. I didn't write that song. I wrote Fast Train, but I didn't write Could Have Been Late. It was a hot chocolate song. Oh, that was a hit in England. So it could have been a lady and bad side of the moon. I didn't write those two songs. It's my life, it's my life, it's my life. David and Richie Henman, Jim Clench, and myself. Yeah. Lasted to the middle of Electric Jewels. Richie left the band. So I got a whole Jerry Mercer from Mash McCann. And I said, I need a drummer for April Wine, you know, to go where I want to go. And when David left the band, I brought in Gary Moffat, who we had known from a band called Pops Merrily from Montreal. And he's a student of the American Songbook. So there's solos on April Wine Records that are just absolutely outstanding. And the best of them are Gary Moffat. Not that Brian Greenway and myself didn't play decent solos, but Gary's were spectacular. So my brother and I played on the third album, Electric Jewels. But I don't know exactly which tracks we're on and which tracks we aren't on. There was two songs of mine that were scheduled to be on that album that were pulled because I was no longer going to be in the band. And when my brother Richie left, Jerry Mercer, the drummer for Mash McCann, was the guy that replaced him. I found out that Miles and Jimmy had been trying to reach me, myself and Gary Moffat, about hooking up with the band. At first, myself and Gary were busy learning Richie and David's parts, the Henman brother parts, you know. So we were copying everything and playing that. In 1973, I had a meeting with Miles to join the band when the Henmans left, but Gary Moffat got the job instead. 
So my brother and I left April Wine and worked with a band called The Dudes with Ryan Greenway. We had an album on Columbia. I joined April Wine when they were in the middle of recording. They had some songs already recorded by the original group. And then myself, Jimmy Clinch, and Gary Moffat finished the album with Miles Goodwin. The record duels came out. That's when I went, ooh, wow. That's when I knew that they had hooked into something. They had the right combination of musicians in the band, because, of course, they had transitioned to Gary Mercer on drums and Gary Moffat. Yeah, that album had some really nice stuff on it. Creeping widow, don't you cry. kids and we were still having fun and because of poor management and everything else there's a lot of frustration electric jewels but we were breaking up while we we're making it so you get songs like electric jewels By the time we got into Electric Jewels, we're developing our own personalities. We're starting to come into music. And the first complete song that I recorded with the band was The Band Has Just Begun. and Dino Danelli on the Rascals wanted to work with April Wine. So they recorded an album called April Wine Live. We recorded at a high school in Halifax as our very first live album. I didn't write that song. That song was for signing with a record label. Doug Morris was the president of that label. And we were in the studio, and Doug said, I want a Hawaiian guitar solo. I said, hang on a second. I went out, and Gary was in the live room, and I said, Gary, would you bring a slide with you? He wants Hawaiian guitar. And Gary said, sure. And he did it. So that's what the solo is. Gary doing these slide things as the president of the record label. The Hawaiian guitar would sound good on the record label. Gene and Dino said, let's do a studio. Stand by. The Monster Album. The song was written by Jim Clench. He wrote the song. And we was in a recording studio. We wanted a way to start the song. And there was a fire bell in the hallway. We took it off the wall, took it into the studio, mic'd it up, recorded it. Talk about ear candy.
Gene and Dino, they said, write us a couple of songs and come on down to New York. So I wrote Tonight's a Wonderful Night, but I wouldn't want to lose your love. And we recorded those two songs in New York. Easy now to let our love go wrong. See, I wrote that on piano. I don't write too much with piano. The thing is, I bought a piano after hearing Elton John. Elton John came on and changed every, you know, a lot of people's lives, did mine. So I wrote Wouldn't Want to Lose Your Love, which was a hit Canada. I wouldn't want to lose your love. From Magically Can, Steve Lang joined April Wine as a bass player. Jimmy Clinch. Yeah, we had some conflict of interest, and we were both young, and there didn't seem to be room for the two of us at that point. So dumb to think about it now. As the band started to get more and more airplay, they began to grow in stature, and now we moved into the arenas. And that our tour was playing arenas from one end of the country to the other end of the first Canadian group to ever ship platinum. April Wine made a quarter inch record. There's no ifs, there's no ands, there's no buts.
As the band started to get more and more airplay, we were selling 300 to 700,000 albums. Those are staggering numbers by today's standard. Much later in April Wine, I was scrounging around for songs for a new record. Here's a song that I wrote in Woody's Termites in about 1966 or 7, and it was actually it was supposed to be my solo record. That's why it's so different for an April Wine song. It goes like this. You won't dance with me. second song, a song called Why, that I tagged onto the first song. So why, when you don't want my love, when you don't want my love. Gary Moffat, guitar solo. Uh, if you listen to Mama Lay, the solo in that. She's never far away. In 1977, when the Rolling Stones wanted to make an unannounced appearance in a Toronto nightclub, jam-packed with music fans, April Wine sold out the house. The first night, it was a good secret for while it lasted. They know that we can sell the venue out. We're going to be like a smoke screen. So it's an April Wine show, but then, hey, look, be a surprise for everybody. Side three is all the Alma combo, which is pulled from just two nights that we did in Toronto at mm -hmm. that 300 seat club. From Montreal, welcome April 1. When I think back, I mean, there's not much to say about that because really it was all about the stones. And don't get in the way of anything because this is big. This is the biggest thing in Canada, anywhere, right at the moment. So it was all about recording the stones. So while he's literally rolling tape, may as well do April 1. My management, we worked out a deal and uh, I enjoyed that experience a lot. In 1977, when Brian Greenway joined us, we broke out of Canada. We got to go around the world a bit and, and sell uh, more records. Yeah, 1977. I was in April Wine for three months during the summer tour to see how I fit in. I played a little keyboard, and I sang, and I wrote a bit, so I fit the bill of what they're looking for. They have an album with two or three top singles in Canada, a gold platinum album in 76, and certified double platinum album in this country, and nothing in the States and nothing in Europe. It's very frustrating. And people started to believe that we can't be that good. But all of a sudden, we got a new record deal. We took a deep breath. We brought everything into focus. We said, let's go with pure rock and roll. Let's write what people want to hear.
Why do you think it happened so quickly? Well, I guess we were a new uh, we were a new group, which helped a lot. But we were seasoned, you know. So we had a lot of our stuff together. And although people thought we were new on the scene, we'd been around, and so we had our thing pretty much worked out. And we could contend with almost any situation from headlining to uh, to being third or whatever. With this much space on stage or the whole stage, we could handle it because for 10 years up here before. <laughs> After the great Canadian success that the band enjoyed for so long without international success, do you think you weren't ready until now, or do you think you've been ready for quite a while? I think one of the big things was First Glance, which is the album that really started it happening. Uh, that was the first album that really focused on the direction that April Wine has taken since then. It was no longer a, a band of, that, of many styles. It was a band that concentrated on rock, and, and that turned it around for us. I sing about rock and roll right now and about having a good time and feeling good and putting out energy and receiving energy back. That's what I'm doing right now. Especially with the American market, is that we are a band that has a lot of experience, but because everything is so new for us in America, we also have a lot of freshness. It's sort of like a, a marriage between those two things, which is not really common. A band that's been around a long time won't really have the freshness, but we were down there putting out, but with a lot of experience, enthusiastic, and, and I think it definitely helped a lot. When I joined with the First Glance album in 78, we were hoping we'd get some push in the States, and all of a sudden, that little station in Michigan started playing Roller, and boom. Roller really didn't get going until the band started playing down there, and then everything sort of naturally developed from people being excited and seeing the band. based on a fictional character that liked to gamble and I wrote that after my first time to Las Vegas. That excitement propelled the single Roller into the U.S. Top 30 and the album First Class was certified gold. What makes April Wine special and different? I find it hard to uh, really put a finger on that, being on the inside, because we, we invariably never see ourselves the way other people do. Apart from the writing, I think the live show has a lot to do with it. You know, a lot of groups are great recording groups, but they don't have a good live show, or vice versa can be true, and it doesn't always work for them there. Uh, when you got that balance, it's, uh, it works well. But in terms of actual characteristic, I really can't see specifically what it is, the combination of things.
Miles was really good for us. He took a lot of our songs and, okay, that part's got to go. He did arranging. He helped immensely in that way, and that, that's sort of overlooked sometimes, besides the actual production. Mm, it's a heartless world. when I was very, very young. I was a drummer back then. And so when I write, I'm always conscious of tempo and time and grooves and things like that. The beat in that song is very unusual. I took it to Jerry and he said, that's really different. How did the name April Wine come about? I think they were sitting around a tavern one day and decided it would be a name that would really nail them down to any style of music or anything like that. It was a name they just liked the sound of. I wasn't around at the time. That was the first April Wine. Miles, maybe you can fill us in. Well, um, David was buying, as I remember, and he came up with a name. And uh, you can't argue with the guy that's buying. <laughs> stage, uh, our sound man, everybody is, uh, is working 100%. There's no weak links in the chain. alongside Styx, Journey, Rush, and Nazareth. This led to international stardom, particularly in the UK, playing the very first Monsters of Rock Festival in Castle Donington, 1980. And the next year headlined the legendary Hammersmith Odeon in London. I've always thought April Wine was just a stellar, incredible rock band. Jerry Mercer. Jerry has a very good ear musically. Like we did a version of 21st Century Schizoid Man, a guitar version of a song that belonged to King Crimson. And I had always wanted to do it since I got Port of the Crimson King by them. And the song was there. And I said, I really want to do this one day. So years go by and then I said, okay. But it was Mercer, some of the really complicated stuff that's syncopated. And Jerry, he worked it on the piano in the studio because we were going like, no, what's it doing there anyway, you know? And it was Jerry, he has a good ear. So he would sit down and figure, no, this is it here. There's, okay, there's the harmony on another song. He, he, he was good that way. That came from his church upbringing. Then in 1984- Uh, 
for Nature of the Beast, we went to England to do it at the Manor Studios, just outside Oxford, England. I always look forward to getting off the road because I can record some more songs. For me, it's very exciting. I know I work with a band that really lead guitarists. <laughs> the first Canadian band on MTV, and with Nature of the Beast selling over a million albums, Paper Wine were at the top of their game. Get my saddle and tie it on, western wind is fast and strong, jump up back, it's good and long, we'll resist till we reach the dawn. Running seems like the best defense Staying just don't make any sense No one could ever stop it now Show the cards of the gypsy town More than a decade, their songs were on every radio station in North America. Well, as you can all see, we've progressed and they've now put a roof over our head. Oh, like it was nothing. I had just returned home from England from recording The Nature of the Beast. And I got a call from a French group called Offenbach. They were just unique. They had their own blues, gutsy rock feel. They're desperate. Their drummer had gotten sick in the hospital, and they don't have a drummer. And then I was on drums, and we pulled it off. As a matter of fact, John found the recording and released it. For drum. Jerry Mercer. The new album is Power Play. gold and seven platinum albums, April Wine toured the world. They produced a string of hits which became instantly recognizable rock anthems.
incredible grace. There's a lot of frustration. We were breaking up while we're making it. Well, Miles walked out of the studio at one point, so Donald went to Miles and convinced him that he should come back. I was done with it. I left April Wine. So, yeah, that was it. April Wine, what was left of us without miles, became men without work. We broke up in 1984. Is the sky really falling? Or does it just seem that way? Where's my reasons for living? Have they all slipped away? It's coming right down on top of me I'm getting so I can't I hardly breathe It's coming right down on top of me Just let me be You know, Skipper Wine had a real hard time at the end. You know, it was not pleasant. We did this tour called One for the Road. It was the last thing we had to do. And boy, that was the hardest thing I think I've ever done. Then for them, too. We did not get along. We did not talk to each other. But we had to go on stage every night and play. It was very, very difficult. So finally, we just couldn't agree on anything at any time. So I said, you know, I'm out of here. And it was over. That was it. Boom. The contract was done. I went back to Nassau. I really had to get out of Montreal. I had to get out of Canada. We get a phone call. Remember, Miles, we need one more album. A contractual album for April Wine. I, they had to have one more album. There was no more April Wine. We'd broken up. So I said, okay, brought in some guys from Montreal. We did an April Wine album without April Wine. But it was not April Wine. It was Marty Simon on drums and Jean Pellerin on bass, Daniel Barb on keyboards, myself on guitar. We recorded it at NASA at the Compass Point Studios. I tried to make it sort of sound like an April Wine album without the group. I so wrote some songs. I asked Brian to come down and I recorded the last April Wine studio album. in the Bahamas. broke up in 1984. Jerry Mercer played in a band called The Buzz Band with Breen LaBeouf from a band called Offenbach. Now, the Buzz Band is brand new, but the players in it have been playing great rock and roll for years. John McGale and Breen LaBeouf spent eight years with the late, great Quebecois blues band Offenbach. 
Drummer Jerry Mercer was the driving force behind some Montreal legends. Triangle, Mash McCann, April 1. It's kind of exciting from that standpoint. I don't feel like, oh, crap, I've got to do this all over again. It's not my attitude at all. It's like, hey, this is great. You can, you can almost compare it to putting together a new song. You know, you're, you're excited about it. You see the potential. You see the possibilities. And the, the April Wine and the Offenbach fans that came. Every band that could uh, go play in a forum and then go play in the Metro <laughs> to catch the people out doing it. <laughs> a fun project. I was done with it, and I left Dave Rowan. And I want to do a solo album. He's from a small town, but had to get away. He took the bus north all the way to South L.A. I wanted the party to continue. You know, I still had a full glass. April Wine reassembled in 1992. So back to the mansion. Steve Siegel didn't want to come back, so we went down to Four Piece for the first time since I had joined the band in 77. French band called Offenbach, and then he's toured and played with the likes of Celine Dion and a lot of other large French stars in this province. He's very well known here. And Green actually played with Jerry Mercer with Offenbach, and then in a band called the Buzz Band.
Cemetery is something that I put together to collect shoes to distribute to the people that are homeless. And I started this with Dr. Van Dyce. So we started collecting shoes right across the country and worked with some good people, including Value Village. And we generally collect about 5,000 pairs of shoes and boots and distribute them to shelters somewhere across the country. When I wrote my memoir, I wrote it for my family and fans. And it was wonderful to have Brian Greenway to back me up because people had no idea why these changes were happening, why people came and went. And the rumors and the folklore, where was Jim Edmond after one album? Where did David and Richie go? And all that kind of stuff, it was like so wrong. So I said, the purpose of this book is to just to make things understood properly. And that's why I wrote it. You don't write everything, you know, you don't write everything that you could, but I wrote what I thought was of interest. I mean, I say at the beginning of the book that I wrote this for my children. I have grandchildren and children, and I wanted my family to know what I've been through because I was never around. I was always on the road. I missed a lot. And I was divorced twice, so writing about those kind of things is very, very hard. But anyway, I wrote it for my family and fans. I'd be remiss if I didn't mention Martin L. Ewish that helped me with this book. Thank you, Marty, for everything you did in my book. So going back eight, nine years now, we auditioned people to replace me, and nobody was happy. And so I said, I'll stay in the band, but under one condition. We cut our shows down to 30 a year. That's it. I spent all of my life with April Wine. I've had no time for anything else, and I'm going to make a little time. So I did. I wrote two books. One of them was a bestseller. I recorded two blues albums, wrote them and recorded and produced them. The first one, Miles Goodwin and Friends of the Blues, came out in 2018. And that Miles Goodwin and Friends of the Blues too, which came out a year later. And I wrote everything. All the songs are mine, except two out of two albums. So, And then I just contacted all these blues players across the country, and some in the U.S., and I said, I wrote some blues songs, and would you play on my blues record? And they responded positively. So I got a lot of great players on those two records, Miles Goodwin and Friends of the Blues and Miles Goodwin and Friends of the Blues too. I've liked the blues, but I don't like everything blues. Here we go back to the songwriting. To me, a great blues song is a great song, like The Thrill Is Gone by B.B. King. I just like really good songs. So my big influence in the blues was a fellow named Tash Mahal, and I have one of his albums called Natural Blues. And I just love the songs. And the man is a brilliant singer and a brilliant writer and performer and player. He's got all of those things. And I put together a little five-piece blues band with Gary Moffat called The Blues Band. my project long pants and it's so not April wine it's so not blues this is just me as an artistic person I do things that you know are connected somehow obviously my memoirs connected to everything I did musically and long pants I the cover which I've just designed is one of my paintings as the basis the main part of the cover this is something I've been working on for 42 years. It's a personal album. It's a very mature album. I have happy songs and sad songs. I have songs about living. I have songs about dying. Songs for every one of my children. Songs for my partner. I have a drinking songs. I, it covers all kinds of things. And it covers a, a couple of very serious, serious issues with Indigenous people in Canada. And it's called Some of These Children, They Never Grew Up. And this is about the unmarked graves of Indigenous children that have been discovered in recent times. And this is a song that was written by Jim Henman and I. And maybe the children can show us a way Out of the sacred ground they're crying today We stole their dreams and then had a tongue They're telling all of us, love what you've done 
have a song about the missing and murdered indigenous women in this country, and that's called Darling, Where Are You? Slowly the sun falls from the sky Though darkness comes, it could never hide All the faces and the names Of the families and the pain that they endure The uncertainty weighs heavy on their hearts While the grief is tearing them apart Echo in the night Darling, where are you? Where are you? And both of these songs I wrote because my life partner, Kim, is Native. She's Sue Assiniboine, and uh, her children are Native, an extension of my family. So what affects them affects me. So that's why I respond to these. They never grew up. This is how I respond to anything. In all of my life, I've never really wanted to get into politics and religion. I just leave them alone. So I stay away from it. But I write songs to what I identify with. In these two cases, I, had, I felt I wanted had something to say. Well, Miles would write the songs on his own, and he'd bring in ideas, and we would learn them and add our own parts, and it would develop that way. So for like an example, like Roller, he came in with the lick and the chords, and then we developed how the arrangement's going to be. Most uh, songwriters that are prolific, we, you know, we have different ways, all, always. Here's something musically that, that kind of get, gets, grabs your imagination, leads you down a path, and you follow it. I'll have lyrics in the beginning with a melody, and then I'll finish the lyrics later. Once I have the whole format together, and I'll tweak, the, massage the lyrics and the music together. And I'll try things in the studios, you know, and eventually come up with something I'm happy with. But the whole process starts typically with me wrapped around a, an acoustic guitar. Uh, yeah, just trying to write from the heart, you know, whatever the direction might be or the project might be, just do the best I can. And, and if I like it, maybe other people will. I write songs to what I identify with, and, and often the lyrics mean something. My daughter was song about her the night she was born. I came home from the hospital. I went into my studio at home, and, and I wrote a song called Forever Amber, and then I went to bed. 42 years later, I finally got to record it, and folks, not one note, not one word has changed since the time I sat down and wrote it, because I nailed it. It's one of those things that was very pure. I've had songs that come quickly, though, just between you and me came very, very quickly, but not like this. Nothing in my experience ever came like first time done. And I mean, some of the stuff that I write for April Wine are just flat out rock and roll songs, period, and don't mean much except, you know, they sound good and they got a good feel. Yeah, so that album, Long Pants, I've been working on it since 1942. I mean, for 42 years. <laughs> Jim Henman and I. Jim and I have known each other since 1963, and we started April Wine together. And we still perform in my trio. It's called Miles Goodwin Trio. Hi, everybody. I'm Miles Goodwin. I'd like to tell you about my acoustic show. It's called Just Between You and Me. It features Jim Henman on guitar and vocals and Bruce Dixon on bass, guitar, and vocals. Could have been all right. Could have been here tonight. Could have been sweet as wine. Jim and I played in a high school band back in the 60s called Woody's Termites. It was during this time that I wrote a song that would become a hit for April Wine. That song was You Won't Dance With Me. When you won't dance with me And you won't hold hands with me Jim and I started April Wine in 1969. The first single from our debut album was called Fast Train. It's a fast train It's a fast train Yes it is She said tonight is a wonderful time Let's fall in love Just Between You and Me is a musical journey that covers 50 years it's a lot of fun. We have stories and anecdotes and, of course, lots of great music. Let's do it. And take me high. Take me high. Say hello. Say hello. Say hello. Sign of the gypsy queen. Back your things and leave. Just between.
just between you and me. And then Ukraine, watching what was going on in Ukraine. And I wrote this song and I put it up. No, I don't know about you. I don't know about you. It's so tragic. My heart is breaking it through for Ukraine. Thank you. Okay. Let me read this, please. I'd like to thank Karis for this fantastic honor on behalf of April Wine members past and present. And they are David Henman, Jim Henman, Rich Henman, Jim Clench, Jerry Mercer, Gary Moffat, Steve Lang, Steve Siegel, Breen LaBeouf, and Blair Mackay, and my buddy, Behind me are Brian Greenway and yours truly, Miles Goodwin. Thank you. Also, a warm thanks to George Elms, to Feldman and Associates, Graham Bishop, Sumakowski, who's no longer with us, to Radio, that has been so generous for all these years, to Dean Cameron, to EMI, to SOCAN, to Terry Flood, to Donald Tarleton, and of course, for the fans, for their love, their respect, and their unwavering support. God bless you. Thank you. When some future rock historian places April Wine in the history of rock and roll, what would you like him to say about Miles Goodwin and April Wine? They did good music. I don't. I mean, there's no way I'm going to be a Mick Jagger or a Paul McCartney. But just to be a good, solid musician, a good, solid person, making good, solid albums, and just to be respected and not to be uh, forgotten. How many more years would you like to do rock and roll? I can't imagine uh, anything less than five or anything more than ten. You know, uh, somewhere around there, I guess. But music forever and ever. I live in Nova Scotia now. April Wine started here. I grew up in Nova Scotia. I'm back here, and I'm now again part of the local music community. Matt Mingle has been around for years. I've known Matt since the 70s, and now we're buddies. I really, really enjoy the community down here. There's so many great players in Nova Scotia. It's, it's like crazy how many great players there are down here. So I'm becoming part of that community, and, the, and it's wonderful. In Quebec, I didn't have that at all. I didn't really know anybody in Quebec. It's a very different place, and I was I was isolated.
Okay, singer, guitarist, songwriter, author, you've done it all. How do you feel about being here tonight? Well, I'm thrilled. This award is really special to me. I mean, um, I've wanted it for a long time. My 50 plus years is about writing songs. Uh, April Wine had a hit in 1971 with a song I wrote in high school. So it feels like it's been a long time coming. Ladies and gentlemen, latest inductee into the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame, Miles Goodwin. Come on up here, Miles. Nice to be here. Hello, everyone. This is an honor to be here tonight, and I am thrilled to get this award. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank April Wine. Yeah. And thanks to radio, especially Canadian radio, for the support all these years. A shout out to fans. Hello, I love you. Thank you to the uh, ECMA for their involvement here tonight. A very special thanks to the Canadian Songwriters Hall of Fame for the recognition and this beautiful award. Thank you. Thank you. April Wine is known for infectious melodies and timeless hits, selling over 10 million albums worldwide. I like to rock. I like to rock. The band's extensive discography includes over 20 classic hits like That Side of the Moon, Roller, I Like to Rock, and Just Between You and Me. Just between they were the first Canadian artists to be played on MTV, etching them in the memories of rock enthusiasts worldwide. Their fifth album, Stand Back, achieved double platinum status in Canada, solidifying their status as a national treasure. In 2009, April Wine was inducted into the Canadian Music Industry Hall of Fame, and they received the Juno Lifetime Achievement Award. The band was also inducted into the Canadian Music Hall of Fame the following year. And here to accept the honor of Canada's Walk of Fame is Miles Goodwin, Jerry Mercer, Brian Greenway of April Wine. They've been with you your whole life. It's a long time. <laughs> now, you guys are famous for being a great live act, rightly so. You earned that. Was it a Canadian audience that helped along the way? Oh, yeah. I mean, we were accepted here well before we were outside of uh, the borders. Uh, yeah, we finally broke through to the rest of the world in 1977 with Roller, and then it went from there. But up until then, from 1969, until 1977, we were just a, a Canadian band, and, and proud of that, too. It would be you know, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. And finally, I mean, how does it feel to be here tonight on this stage with this audience this night? You no, know, it's fantastic. Just to be with everybody else that's been inducted. I mean, I don't tour anymore. I gave it up early this year, and uh, the band tours without me, and they're killing it. They're absolutely amazing. Under Brian's leadership, and uh, I was just tired of traveling. I didn't want to do it anymore. Uh, but I write and produce and everything for them still. You know, I still do all those things, but I just don't travel anymore. I just wanted to say, uh, April Wine started in 1969 in Nova Scotia. And, uh, 
The members of the band there, the original four guys, are in the room. And I would like to introduce Jim Henman, David Henman, and Richie Henman. Just come up and, and so everybody gets to come on up, guys. We got the band back together. We have the band back together. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, April Wine. Maritime rock legend Miles Goodwin passed away in hospital this morning. The group was inducted into the Canadian Walk of Fame just a couple of months ago. Miles Goodwin. Or 75. Well, the last voice I hear be an angel. Well, I leave this world peacefully. Well, the last voice I hear be an angel. Say and take my hand. Thank everybody that supported April Wine and myself all these years. You know, I want to be known at the end of my days as a songwriter. And that's that's the truth. 